Good morning and welcome once again to another series in the Alpha, of the elephant in the room. And this time I have a continuing conversation with uh, Ms. Nanjala Nyabola, author of Digital Democracy Analog Politics that was published in 2018. And just uh, this last Thursday, she, she launched a new, yet a new book which she'll be telling us about today, Traveling While Black, published in 2020. Uh, Nanjala is also a political analyst and activist, besides being a, a prolific author. Uh, Karibu Nanjala. Sana. <laughs> Great. Well, I just wanted to, to sort of pick up where we, we, uh, we left off last time. Um, and um, take, take in a slightly different uh, di direction and talk about elections and, and, uh, and all these digital tools and social media and, and, and what, what the implications are. Um, for, for many of us Africa, not only Africans, but all, all peoples who live in countries where rights are, um, uh, are limited uh, by the leadership, uh, the social media space has become uh, the space in, into which they can enter and say and vent and, and you know, some of these tools are used to organize. I mean, Telegram has been used in Iran, um, in Sudan, they're using these kind of networks. We've seen the recent elections in Tanzania, um, where the ruling party won by sort of, uh, I can't remember the majority, but I think, you know, uh, sort of really quite... Quite, quite incredible. Um, but again, there, um, it was interesting that one of the first actions they took after uh, winning the election was at least to, to publish the intention to pass a law to, to, to criminalize uh, people using virtual private networks, which shows uh, the extent to which social media was part of you know, the political ecosystem during these last elections in Tanzania. But let me ask you about that, uh, Nanjala. You've been an astute observer of what's happened, what's happened here in Africa uh, to our democracy, democratic processes and our freedoms. Um, you, know, you call this, this, technology, this, this technology and these platforms as intensifiers. Uh, when, when, when we last spoke. Um, but then I look at what's happening in the United States, uh, where many of these things were invented um, and have spread around the world, the world's biggest companies that, uh, that um, we, you know, that, 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 uh, whose platforms we use are based there. But I, I just wanted to get your take, just your, your reflections on, on, on the US elections. And then just exposed to that, the Tanzanian elections and the role of social media uh, and, and, and the internet in, in, in this. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that has emerged very clearly over um, the last, well, it's not even over the last 10 years, because I actually pointed this out in my book based on my um, studies of the Arab Spring. One thing that people tend to forget um, is that power, as much as citizens and individuals are learning and adapting, power is also learning and adapting. Yeah. And so you have, you're basically constantly in this Tom and Jerry sort of cat and mouse situation where you're trying to, the citizens are trying to be two steps ahead of power yes. and power is, is sort of trying to catch up. Yeah. And so in that context, um, I always say to activists when we're talking about digital uh, rights and digital whatever, is that you have to sort of keep adapting, keep moving, keep, keep pacing because these guys are not going to remain ignorant and are not going to remain um, unaware of what's organizing is happening online indefinitely. So what you're seeing right now is, you know, five years ago, I would venture that a lot of governments in this region had no idea what a VPN was. Yeah. Um, they would probably would never, if you went to the Uganda, UCC, the Tanzanian, even this uh, communications authority here in Kenya, they would have never known what a VPN was. Yes. But now, not only do they know what they are, they know how powerful and potent they make the digital space. And so there's this push to regulate, there's this push to, to shut it down, basically, because it creates a point of resistance that the central state cannot deal with. So yeah. um, we have to keep learning and keep adapting. And I, But, you know, the United States is an interesting case, because as you said, this is where these technologies come from. Uh, yeah. A lot of these social networking platforms are American social networking platforms. I think Telegram is Russian. Um, and what you see is for a long time these companies didn't know how to regulate political speech by powerful people especially 
Because you're an American company. You're licensed in the United States. Right. Your shareholders are American. Yeah. You're responsive to an American legislator. And the most powerful person in that country is using your platform to undermine the democracy, to undermine the political context that makes your company possible. Yeah. So what do you do in that context? You know, <laughs> nobody wanted for a long time, nobody wanted to be the person to tell Trump to rein it in. Yeah. You saw a lot of hesitation and it didn't, it wasn't until the last, probably the last six months yes. that there was suddenly a realization that this man cannot be reasoned with. This yeah. is not a person that you allow that much leeway to because he takes it and he doubles down. Yes. There've been at least two studies, um, one from Stanford, um, the other one came out yesterday, yeah. that Trump has been the leading driver of misinformation on COVID-19 in the, <laughs> in the world, yes. um, or at least in the United States. Yes. leading driver of misinformation around the election. Yes. Right? That's not a person that you reason with. That's not a person that you give space. But because yes. they've given him space, now suddenly there there's definitely a, a critical mass of Americans who believe that the, Ameri the election was rigged, who believe that the, that uh, Trump was the rightful winner, who yes. believe that there's a secret conspiracy of child tra traffickers who, you know, like the QAnon conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that tension between... Yeah, there's a tension between, um, I think, and for me, the, 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 the real underlying issues, and for, I, I, like I always emphasize, I'm not a techie. I'm not really, I learn just enough about the technology to be able to understand how it will layer on to society, to existing society, um, so social dynamics and political dynamics. Yeah. And I'll say this, I think one of the things that has emerged is that the social networking companies did not have the internal capacity mm. to understand society, mm. to understand politics, mm. to deal with that effectively. Mm. And they didn't understand that there's a lot of things that cannot be quantified, that cannot be measured, that are also part of the calculation, trust, yeah. um, transparency, Mm. Um, you know, accountability. There's so many things that go into a social system that are not necessarily, cannot be quantified by STEM, yes. you know, that can't be done by calculus. Yes. And so the awakening is slow. Yeah. And, and because they, and these are things that we who live in uh, countries where they were not paying attention, we, would have, we could have told them for free, you know, yeah. 10 years ago, five years ago. Yes. Um, so what we're seeing, I, I guess, with the regards to social networks and elections is that finally the social networking sites are rising to the realization that they, are, they cannot be abstract, they cannot be removed from the consequences of just, if you're a player in the political space, you have responsibilities. You have demands that are on you and yes. you have to rise to those demands. Yes. The tension is going to be how they have positioned themselves as global companies. Yes. The politics in Tanzania, the politics in the DRC, yes. the politics in India, the politics in Brazil, completely different beasts. So can you in good conscience be in your office in you know, Silicon Valley in San Francisco, making decisions about how your platform will work? Yes without understanding how the 100, other 196 countries in the world will receive that, yeah. will react to that based on their local context. Mm. And um, I think it's a grand philosophical challenge. And I'm, I, I wouldn't say that I'm entirely optimistic. Um, I've met with a lot of regulators um, from different countries in the last two or three years. And all of them kind of have the same trepidation and the realization that maybe letting these guys who dropped out of college after two years um, build these mega platforms with no restraints on their power, maybe it wasn't the best idea. <laughs> so that's kind of, I think, where the world is. It's like this, oh, we've, we've made a mistake yeah. and not really knowing how to walk it back. Yeah, but uh, but uh, Nanjala, I, 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 and I hear you, and, and you know, uh, President Trump has been a, an incredible. I, mean, I, I it took me time to believe that um, an American president would tweet um, so often, and that it became his primary 
um, sort of co you know uh, yeah. vehicle of communication even with, with even his own people. Um, but you know, I always am struck by conversations I have with uh, especially Westerners um, and their concerns mm -hmm. uh, around the social networks are to do with privacy. Um, issues of privacy and the fact that these uh, social networking companies are basically hoovering up our our data, selling it, and their model um, is is basically buying up our behavior uh, and 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 where we've been and 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 and, yeah. and, and selling that on. And it, and we've seen that some um, masters of the dark arts of of the manipulation of. of of news, et cetera, have gone on into the game and Cambridge Analytica was involved in the election here in 20, uh, 2013, again in 2017, in Nigeria in 2015, and, and in other parts of the world, uh, in Brexit in 2016, in the UK. But, um, but at the same time, if you talk about a country like Tanzania, where they just recently had some really controversial elections, um, the space in which Africans remain uh, free uh, to vent, and I've been following, for example, the Ethiopian sites uh, mm -hmm. recently, as 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 they seem to sort of be heading into a very very difficult time with a, with, with with a war in in in, uh, in with, with Tigray up in the north. Um, but so this this remains a space in which Africans can express themselves freely in ways that they can't uh, on the streets. So so that's positive. Um, but at the same time, when one sits through some of what people are saying, you realize it's very, very virulent, divisive, mm -hmm. angry. Uh, so people aren't really talking with each other. They, they, they are sh shouting at each other. Uh, and mm -hmm. so I wanted to ask, you know, what, what the implications are of this. When, when democratic space is constricted to the point that we find ourselves, um, you know, very significant people in Kenyan society um, comment on on major national policies first on twitter you on know twitter. yeah yeah we have and, and the, the this the interesting thing for me has always been that twitter has no idea that this is happening it's only yeah, you they like i said you know they in the previous interview they appointed their first sub-saharan africa person in january 2020 wow. January 2020 yeah and that person uh is based in dublin okay so <laughs> They, they actually, for the longest time, had no idea that this was happening, had no idea that African civil society had really seen this as a place where we could do things that we couldn't do offline, we couldn't gather offline, we couldn't, you know, you're, we, we Kenyans work so long, we work such long hours, we're in traffic for two hours, three hours, you yeah. know, in one direction, getting people to come out to a protest is yeah. so difficult. Yeah. But you know, you can sit in your office and you can tweet and you can be in traffic and you can tweet and things like that. So there's this, it's, it created an opportunity for a political discourse that just wasn't happening in the offline space the way that you would want it to happen. Yeah. But again, with the realization that this is happening and we could be a potential market, the energy around that is changing. And this is what I think people who, this is where this tension is gonna come in. Yeah. The problem is that these social networking sites are optimized for advertising. So whenever I use a VPN on my phone and I'm trying to see something in the United States, I'm trying to see something in Canada, the first thing that I'm always struck by yeah. is the amount of advertising. Yeah. It's crazy. Every other tweet is an advert. Yes. The Twitter experience in North America and even in Europe is completely different from what we're getting here. Yeah. Because there are very few people here who are spending on advertising the yes. way that they are spending in the U.S. Yes. The problem is that that model of advertising, um, tweaking your algorithms and, and making it possible for people to pay for influence, when it's layered with political discourse, people who think that their ideas are good and sound very rarely are going to spend money on amplifying them. I'm saying uh, the right thing. Okay. Why do I need to pay for advertising to do it? Okay. Who is going to spend money to influence political opinion? It's yeah. people who want things to go bad. It's people who have bad interests at heart. Yeah. And this is the tension that these models are, are having, is that 
the propensity to spend money to influence political opinion yeah. swings very dramatically towards people who are trying to sway opinion in the negative, to people who need to spend money in order to convince people to come over to their side. Yeah. And so what we're seeing, what you've talked about, this Berlin sort of, the human beings are always, there's always this, there's always a duality. Yes. What it is, is that what tips the scales in one direct, more in one direction than in the other. There's always good and bad. There's always good and bad. There's always good and bad. What is it that's going to make the bad elevate over the good? Yes. It's, if we, 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 they haven't really figured out how to incubate positive discourse. Yeah. They haven't really, they just assume that it will travel naturally, that it will just move through the, the digital ecosystem naturally. And so there's, when, when, for example, when women complain about harassment, yeah. you see this whole thing, this hesitation to rein in, you know, harassment and, and Il, 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 Ilhan Omar, um, you know, she gets the worst abuse on, on social media. Yes. And she pointed out the irony of, um, who was it? I think it was Joe Biden or, or I think it must have been Joe Biden yes. um, getting special treatment on, on, on harassment and how they were going to finally um, intervene and they're not going to let this get out of control. And she and uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, AOC and Rashida Tlaib were like, we've been enduring this insane amount of abuse for the last two years. Now you think it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's something that has to happen whereby they, they have to realize that you can't assume that the good news or the positive information or the positive conversation is going to have momentum just because it's positive. Yeah. Meanwhile, you've made it so easy for the negative mm -hmm. news to get that momentum. Mm -hmm. have, having said all of that, mm -hmm. I'm thinking about what you, your question about um, all of these, these, these frac lines of fracture that are being exacerbated in countries like Ethiopia yeah. and in countries like, well, it's, 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 this is something that I'm grappling with yes. um, intellectually. It's something that it's the focus of some of the work that I'm trying to do now. And is to think about the nature of communication yeah. and information. Yeah. And I, I keep asking myself, are we supposed to communicate this much? Okay. Like maybe we're just, <laughs> maybe oh. we're just not supposed to communicate this, this much. much. Maybe okay. like, and that's, it's not, that's, that's one of those sort of like, I'm just testing it out. I haven't really firmed up the thinking behind it. It's, it's just kind of where I'm at uh, in terms of this is something that I want to, I want to look deeper into and think deeper about. I know it's, it's, it's one of the things that I, they, they I wonder if, yeah. We no, as a species, yes, you know, like we're, we're made to to. Are we supposed to have this much information about each other? <laughs> and and uh, it's instantaneous, and it's 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 in it's in two three lines, and you're expressing an entire range of of emotions and feelings about an issue, uh, in caps. You know. issue. Uh, but and then everybody projects everything onto it. So I could go online and I could say. I think Kenshik had the best chips in Kenya. Yeah. And I tweeted out. And then someone comes and says, why do you hate KFC? What is it that you, what is this bias that you have against KFC? And then someone else comes and says, you elitist middle-class people with your Kenshik, you don't even eat mutura, you don't appreciate your culture. <laughs> and the person says, you know, like, if you, you we, the tweet, the 256 or 200 or whatever characters. Yes is really just like a little sliver of a person's life, perspectives, opinions, yeah. whatever. And we are projecting so much onto that tweet. Yes. Um, because that's the nature of what, like, even if we were in the street, that's what we would be doing, we would be yes. projecting. But when I think about this upcoming generation that is not going to know what it's like to have a separation between your online life and your offline life. Yes. Um, I think that there's a, there's a, this generation, there's the Gen Z, they, they are digi what they call them digital natives. They're people who, for whom there, was, there is no before. There yes. is no landline. There is no 
you have to send a letter and you have to wait six weeks to get the, the, the message back. There's no instinct to delay communication. Yes. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm leaning in, what I'm trying to explore in this sort of next wave of research is thinking about that tension of maybe the oversaturation with communication makes us vulnerable to um, perceiving extreme emotions or extreme opinions because everything else sort of gets lost in the noise. All of the subtleties, all of the nuances, all of the context, all of the background sort of gets lost in the noise and we are only attuned to extreme opinions. Yeah. And it sounds very abstract, but yeah. when I look again, when I look at Ethiopia, I think, and I look at Kenya even, I think is having, is being constantly saturated with information that is attuned to extremes, making it impossible for us to hear. hear um, everything else. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm still working on it. It's just, mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, uh, so for someone like you, who's an intellectual and an author, uh, conversation is your mainstay. You know, it is it is your fodder. You know, it, it's <laughs> uh, so. How, uh, how how are you doing it? I mean, uh, um, usually you'd be you know you're, you're speaking at events. You're you're mixing with you know with with colleagues uh, at, at different events. You're having conversations. You're sitting down. You're sort of ruminating over ideas, turning them around in your head, debating them back and forth. Um, how you know especially now the covid pandemic that has locked us down um still further and are using this technology the network technology <laughs> all the more as we are doing at this very moment yeah. uh, how you know how does nanyala uh nyabola sit down and have a conversation with five that. people to to queue, just to sort of uh, explore these tensions you're talking about. Uh, that's that's number one. Because while you think about that, it, it just occurred to me. Um, we had a case in this past week where um, some young ladies, something seemed to have happened to some young lady yeah. uh, as a result of their mm-hmm. some sort of kidnap or, or, or lured somewhere, groomed or something. I don't. I'm not sure what it was, but you know, fortunately they were. They were um, you know, they were discovered and safe and the investigation is ongoing. But, um, so, so my second question, uh, there's a question about how, how, you, how you manage conversations, especially given that is your, your, your fodder for, uh, for, for the work that you do. Um, but then I'd also like to, to hear your, your, your comments or, or thoughts that you'd share with parents who, especially in this COVID period, um, yeah. stuck, with, stuck with the kids in the house uh, all day, uh, being forced to be class teacher and headmaster and mother and father all at the same time. It's, I've seen them, a lot of our parents go stir crazy. So kids are allowed to run free. And one of the things that kids do is, you know, they can be allowed to disappear into the ether of, yeah. of, 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 of these social yeah. networks. What are the implications yeah. of that? And, and, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, to the first question, the best answer is I, I'm still working on it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't, I can't in good conscience say that I, I nailed it. Okay. Um, I'm working on it every day is a process. Um, I, I miss flying, but the thing that I miss about flying is having that 24 hours of being completely disconnected. Um, you know, because you're when you're going to the airport, you're on the plane. You're there's no anything, yes. and and then I sleep, and then I'm awake. You know, I I miss that yeah. that because I I didn't realize until now how important that was to my process of yes. rejuvenation. Yes. So yeah, I I don't know. I'm working on it. Every day is different. Every day is a is a is a process. Um, in terms of well. In terms of the second question, the first thing I'll say is I look. I'm not a parent, so I'm, I'm yes. always very reluctant to give parents advice um, because I think it, it's such a demanding thing to be a parent, and it's such an all-consuming thing. Um, but from an analytical perspective, what I've been thinking about a lot is this paradigm of education that we created, 
Yes. Whereby we take all of these 600,000, 800,000, 1 million kids. Yeah. We put them in this uh, pipeline. Yes. And we just force them, force them through the pipeline, force them through the pipeline, force them through the pipeline. And when you think about how the Kenyan education system is working today, really, I would venture to say probably only about 10 percent of kids are actually getting an education yes. because our system is attuned to reward the top yes. and ignore everybody else and so i feel like this crisis can be a moment to start reimagining our paradigm of education mm. and think about what it means to learn that maybe um, I have I have friends who are parents in other countries, and they are doing these pods, um, whereby because the schools are closed, they they get it together. It's part they they have an extended bubble, so it's like okay. four families with kids who are the same age. Yes. And they hire a tutor. Okay. And so the, the everybody in that bubble that's that's their social life, that's their everything. And I saw that, and I thought, this is like when our ancestors used to sit under the tree yeah. and, you know, <laughs> teach. Yes. Yes. So. Is it an invitation to return to a much more holistic paradigm of education? Yes. And so the question is, how do we provide materials for children and for families? Uh, is your radio broadcasts, yes. you know, guided readings, newspapers, yes. printing, yes. you know, free syllabi and things like that, so that kids can learn at their own pace. Yes. And you know, the Montessori system, the Swedish system, I think also. Kids don't take exams because they're in standard age. You have to take the exam. Yes. You take the exam when you're ready. Yeah. When you feel ready, you take yeah. the exam. And if yeah. you don't feel ready, you can wait a year. You can yeah. wait two years. You can take it earlier if you're ready. Yeah. And so we're not just checking off the boxes, but we're thinking about in, in holistic ways. I feel like a lot of what happens in Kenya is people doing things because we've been told this is how things are supposed to be done and not really interrogating the why. Mm. Why do kids have to get up at five in the morning to be at school by seven? You know, all yes. of those things. Yes. And I, I worry that I see how the CS of education is behaving mm. and he just wants to get all the kids back in the pipeline, regardless of the risk, yes. regardless of the trauma. I mean, you, did you see you saw the video of the kids who were crying because of the principal died of COVID? Yes. That's trauma. Those yeah. kids are going to have to live with that trauma. And, and we've lost, I think, 13 principles so far. Right, yeah. um, so, and then, sorry, just to say about these, these girls who've gone missing, one of the things that I thought was really interesting about that um, scenario is what you asked me in the beginning. People often, the, the lazy argument is always that social networking, social media doesn't matter that you have to go out on the streets and do real stuff. Yes. The alarm over those girls was raised almost a week ago. The first time she, the, the cousin flagged her, her cousin had, it was almost a week ago. Is that and true? it had been, yeah, it had been going around um, uh, Twitter and had gone around WhatsApp a little bit and people had been forwarding, forwarding, forwarding on WhatsApp, but nothing had happened. When she went online and did the second video, and uh, on Friday, Thursday, and then tagged, people started tagging DCI, tagging DCI. Okay. It's the first time I've seen DCI respond yeah. and say, we're looking into it. Yes. Now we don't know the details. There's, there's, there's different versions of the story coming up, but the bottom line is it might not be that linear mattering that you want, but if the details of the story that are in the public domain are, are true and correct, Twitter might have saved those girls' lives. People tweeting might have saved those girls' lives. Yes, yes. And so it's another reminder that importance, significance, mattering isn't always a linear thing. Yes. People are using these platforms in creative and innovative ways that reflect their own um, creativity and agency and things like that. Yes. And, and it's not just about having 40 million Kenyans on Twitter. Yeah. It's about what do the one million Kenyans who are on Twitter, what are they using it for? Yes. Yeah. And that is equally important. Thanks, uh, Nanjala. As I said, whenever we, we start talking, the time sort of flies. So I'm going to pause a little bit and, okay. and 
come back.